Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this afternoon session uh, for this year's U4 conference. My name is Dr. Paul Rose from the University of Exeter, and it's my great pleasure to chair this first afternoon session. Just a reminder, uh, we've got questions that can be posted in the Slack for speakers and posters as we go. You can also find more information on certificates of attendance for the conference, um, as well as further details about uh, the conference more generally on the link that you've been sent. So if you have any questions to do with the background to the conference and registering your attendance and getting a certificate for that, please do check the communication that you've had for you for. We have questions that can be posted um, in the question panel, which we will field at the end uh, of the talks. And we've got a mix of longer and short talks in this first afternoon session. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce the first talk, which is uh, Lisa Yon, and she's going to be talking about policy to inform captive elephant management. Good afternoon. I'd like to speak with you today about how we used evidence to inform policy for captive elephant management. There has been increasing public concern about captive elephants in a wide range of different settings. There are elephants in zoos and safari parks in the UK, in the US, in Europe, and at other zoos and safari parks across the globe. There are also elephants involved in different activities in range countries. This includes elephants used for tourism in things like safaris, elephant encounters, elephant rides, and other elephant activities. And there are also elephants that are used as working elephants, for example, in logging activities. From a historic perspective, it's not always clear how many policies and legislation on captive elephant care were developed. And following on from that, it's not always clear how those policies or legislation then affected elephant welfare. There is increasingly recognition of the importance of using evidence to inform development of legislation, including for the care of captive wildlife, such as elephants. And beyond that, to ensure that those policies result in positive welfare for those elephants. Thus, seeking to ensure that elephants are not just surviving, but are actually thriving, that they have a good quality of life. Much of the work I'm going to describe today comes from activities we were involved with through participation on the Elephant Welfare Group a multi-stakeholder committee whose members include keepers, veterinarians, and directors from UK zoos, animal welfare charities, people from UK government, and from the regional organization, the British and Irish Association of Zoos and Aquariums, as well as academics such as myself. The EWG works in partnership with colleagues from elephant holding zoos across the UK to drive forward a series of improvements in the welfare and care of elephants in UK zoos. I head up the behavior subgroup of the EWG and more recently also serve as vice chair. I'll now briefly describe a few of the studies we undertook to try and address some of the gaps in our knowledge which we identified. We sought to generate evidence on some of the physical and social resources that are important to elephants. If we're thinking about positive welfare, we need to think about how we can encourage zoo elephants to behave naturally, so it can be useful to start by considering how they behave in the wild to try and encourage similar behaviors in captive elephants. In the wild, elephants live in mother-calf units as the most basic and essential social relationship that exists. This then extends to encompass a multi-generational family herd, including sisters and brothers, aunties, cousins, and grandmother. This means that many elephants live in very close contact with their immediate and extended family members throughout their lives. 
So how can we encourage better relationships in our captive elephants? We undertook a brief study to see whether the presence or absence of family ties, that is genetic relatedness, might affect how well captive elephants get along with each other. So we studied elephants at two different zoos in the UK. Zoo A, where the elephants were almost completely unrelated to one another, and Zoo B, where all the elephants in the group were each related to one another. And we evaluated the frequency of affiliative and agonistic behaviors between the elephants at these two zoos. What we found was that at the zoo where the elephants were all related to one another, there were a lot more positive affiliative social interactions between all of the elephants. And at the zoo where they were less related to each other, they spent a lot more time engaged in agonistic behaviors. So how can we encourage positive natural social behaviors in captive elephants? Ideally, we want to have multi-generational family herds at each zoo. And indeed, many zoos are trying to move increasingly towards managing their elephants in such family herds. Another study we undertook explored how we could promote resting behavior in zoo elephants. We know that for all animals, resting behavior, and specifically sleep, is essential for good well-being. Lying rest allows an animal to enter delta wave sleep when all the muscles relax. It's during this phase that cellular regeneration occurs, so it's essential for health that an animal has enough sleep and it has to be of good enough quality or they will suffer from poorer welfare and poor health. So we wanted to know how to improve the amount and quality of lying resting captive elephants. We investigated two variables that we thought would have an impact. The substrate that they were lying on and their social access to other elephants. Unsurprisingly, where a soft substrate was available, elephants would preferentially engage in lying rest on that soft substrate. And where they only had access to concrete overnight, they didn't lie down to sleep at all. An important aspect of elephant life is that they are a highly social species and they like to have lots of physical contact. You can often see them brushing against each other and touching one another with their trunks. So we found that elephants would lie down to rest for a longer when they were within two body lengths of another elephant. And indeed, many of them liked to directly touch another elephant while they were lying down to sleep. So in order to encourage lying rest in elephants, it's best to provide a soft substrate, preferably sand, and give them access for physical contact with other elephants. As part of our work on the EWG, we were asked to make an evidence-based review of the government guidelines for management of elephants in zoos, the elephant section of the Secretary of State Standards of Modern Zoo Practice. We therefore investigated the evidence of physical and social resources important to elephants. As part of this evaluation, we looked at the strength of the evidence of the importance of each resource. We first went to the literature. This involved a scoping review of the peer-reviewed publications, and we also looked at the non-peer-reviewed gray literature, such as keeper journals, which can be a very important source of information recorded by people working directly with elephants every day. We also looked at unpublished work, including reports from undergraduate and postgraduate research projects conducted at one or more zoos. Then we undertook a critical appraisal, which looked at the strength of evidence for a particular resource. The critical appraisal included an evaluation of the sample population, the design of the study, the reliability and validity of what was done, the sampling technique used, the methods used to assess the welfare of the elephants, the statistical methods used, 
any recommendations and conclusions that came out of the study. This table is an excerpt showing an example of the critical appraisal we used as applied to some of the peer-reviewed papers we evaluated. We looked at the country where the research was done, the genus, whether it was African or Asian, the number of elephants studied, and the study design, for example, if it was observational or if there was experimental work, the number of repeated measures of the same animal, the method used to assess the elephant's welfare, and the type of validity evaluated and the statistical methods used. We also conducted focus group interviews with elephant keepers, veterinarians, curators, and researchers who studied elephant behavior in captivity or in the wild. This expert opinion can serve as an additional source of evidence in a field where there's a paucity of published research. The topics for these focus group interviews included the features of the environment important to elephants, the kind of ideal elephant exhibit they would design, including both indoor and outdoor elements, and what they thought was important environmental enrichment which should be provided to captive elephants. So some of the consistent findings from our focus group interviews regarding the physical environment important for welfare included that it should be a complex environment and one that encourages exercise, such as moving around the enclosure or bathing in a pool. The substrate is important. It should be comfortable for sleep. It could be used for dust bathing and it should be a substrate that's good for feet, such as sand. They also commented that there should be varied terrain provided and a physical environment that encourages social interactions, such as providing mud wallows or pools. Consistent themes that emerged from the focus groups regarding the social environment was to move toward elephants that were living in a more related group and that considered larger group sizes. However, it was emphasized repeatedly that social compatibility was a lot more important than just group size. And in an ideal herd, there should be a multi-generational family group. This is an excerpt from one of the sections in the SSSMZP, our suggested changes and the evidence in support of these recommendations. The first column contains the guidelines as they currently existed. The next column has comments or suggested changes to the SSSMZP, and the other columns relate to the evidence identified in support of this. It specified the particular resource that was suggested, and then the evidence for that resource from the critically reviewed literature, from the gray literature, from literature about wild elephants, and the ranking of importance on a scale from 0 to 10 from a stakeholder workshop that was held with keepers, vets, curators, animal welfare charities, and academic researchers who studied captive or free-living elephants. Many of the changes that we recommended were evaluated by our expert advisory panel, and they looked at the evidence that we had of the physical and social resources of importance based on the peer-reviewed and gray literature, based on the stake stakeholder focus groups, and the ranking of these resources by our stakeholders at the workshop that we held. Changes were then recommended and many of these changes were subsequently adopted in a next version of the SSS MZP that was released in June of 2017. I then used the lessons learned from this work to look at how this could inform international practices to encourage positive elephant welfare. Globally, captive elephant tourism is changing. It's moving away from giving elephant rides to having more elephant encounters that involve feeding the elephants or observing and photographing the elephants. I was subsequently involved in a number of initiatives seeking to share and encourage best practice for positive welfare for captive elephants. 
I developed and coordinated a workshop for a number of captive elephant facilities from across Thailand. The focus of the workshop was on elephant welfare and behavioral management, which included a wide range of stakeholder participants, including elephant camp owners, veterinarians, mahouts, and academic researchers. developed and coordinated a workshop for a number of captive facilities from across Thailand. The focus of the workshop was on elephant welfare and behavioral management with a wide range of stakeholders, including elephant camp owners, veterinarians, mahouts, and researchers. And at this workshop, we engaged in the sharing of ideas and best practice to provide positive welfare for captive elephants. At the workshop, we engaged in a sharing of ideas and best practice to provide positive welfare for captive elephants. I was similarly involved in an initiative to develop standards to encourage management practices to promote positive elephant welfare across Southern Africa. I was similarly involved in an initiative to develop standards to encourage management practices promoting positive elephant welfare in a consortium of facilities across Southern Africa, including Zimbabwe, Zambia, and South Africa. I attended a series of workshops throughout 2018 and 2019, which included attendees from facilities across Southern Africa as well as academics from the UK and from the US. On from this, as a direct product of these workshops, we created some standards for managing captive elephants in the region. These standards were co-produced with local industry, government, and animal health and welfare charities. In conclusion, this approach can provide a template for doing similar work in other regions and involving other species. The framework we developed can serve as a robust evidence base for decision makers and can also be used to contribute to guidelines. It is absolutely essential that stakeholders, such as elephant keepers, are evolved from the beginning. We can make use of their expertise and it will also help to try and ensure buy-in or giving them a sense of ownership of the outputs. For information about our larger program of work, please visit our project website, view our social media pages, or contact us at the email address shown here. Thank you very much for your attention and please feel free to post any questions. Thank you very much, Lisa. If you would like to pop your camera on, that would be brilliant. Lisa, thank you for an excellent talk. I think you might be muted. Um, perfect, you... thank you. Yeah, perfect. Um, so we've got time sure for some of those we've slides got, are needed. Apologies. That's all right. We've got time for a couple of quick questions, if that's OK. Um, the first question that relates to a previous report uh, that came out in the UK about 10 years ago, um, and it states that because there were challenges around elephant welfare, if there wasn't substantial improvements, then the population might not be self-sustaining and elephant keeping might be phased out. So now we're 10 years on from that report. Is there any update on that? Um, yes, thank you very much for the question. It's a really important one and it is part of the work that I've been involved with as part of the EWG. So we worked with zoos over the past, well, since 2010, um, to look at um, trying to uh, encourage uh, and, and document the evidence of the impact of the improvements that have been made. Um, that report was submitted to government and we're actually just awaiting um, feedback uh, from the government on that uh, and, and subsequent release of the report. So watch this space, it'll be coming out soon. Watch this space indeed. And 
But just uh, one last question before we have to move on, I'm afraid. And um, you've been very popular, so hopefully people will post their questions in the Slack. Um, when you mentioned about zoos A and B, uh, could you explain what species of elephants you were observing? And other than relatedness, what other significant factors influence social and aggressive behaviours? Um, so the the genus was that they were both Asian elephant uh, groups. Um, and um, yeah, I guess I probably would have to think about, but would very much welcome uh, a more extended discussion about the other factors that influence their social interactions. I think some of it probably is around um, the space that's available, whether there's um, access to multiple versions of the, the any highly uh, coveted resources um, and the particular the, the particulars of the personalities, for example, of the elephants that are involved. But yeah, I'd be happy to to give more detail um, following up maybe in the Slack space. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thanks, Lee. So I think um, if people do want to move their other questions for you into the Slack, that would be amazing. Um, one final thing just for me, you mentioned that elephants are really uh, in the public awareness, really obvious, you know, for their welfare problems. Do you have any idea why that is, why people consider their welfare so important? Um, I think they're, well, they're charismatic megafauna, uh, and for whatever reason, I think that they do sort of capture the, the attention of the public. I think because they are also a long-lived species, um, and also one that is highly social with really strong family ties, I, I suspect that we can kind of relate to them, um, but they're kind of di different and interesting at the same time. Brilliant. Lisa, thank you very much. That was excellent. We shall move swiftly on, but thank you very much. Pleasure. So, the next talk in today's agenda is uh, from Olivia Edgar Price, who will be talking about uh, risk factors for visually mediated uh, locomotor ARBs in dogs. Hi, I'm Olivia, and today I'll be talking about my MRES project titled Exploring the Risk Factors for Visually Mediated and Locomotor Abnormal Repetitive Behaviours in Dogs. Abnormal repetitive behaviours, or ARBs, are defined as the repetition of motor patterns that lack an apparent goal or function, called stereotypies, and the repetition of seeking an inappropriate goal, which are called compulsions. ARBs are present in multiple species, but are mainly studied in captive animals, such as zoo, farm, or lab animals. There is less research into companion animals, and most of the companion animal research is in horses. There are previous studies with dogs, but form-specific risk factors are limited, and usually the ARB forms are pulled together. ARBs can be caused by poor welfare, which can include frustration or a lack of stimulation that is usually linked to confinement and husbandry that limits behavioural expression. They can also be due to pain. ARBs can also be due to brain dysfunction that originates in the basal ganglia, which are the structures that sequence movement. ARBs are caused when there is a release of dopamine that increases the sensitivity of the basal ganglia, and this hyperactivates the direct pathway, which is the pathway that initiates movement and therefore triggers the repetition of motor patterns. ARBs can also be due to a genetic predisposition. In minks, ARB development is about 30% heritable, and in dogs, siblings seem to share a predisposition for developing ARBs. In dogs, the different ARB forms can be categorised into five different categories. The first one is locomotory, the next is oral, the next category is aggressive behaviours, then it is vocal, and finally visual, which is sometimes termed hallucinatory. In dogs, ARBs are linked to suboptimal environments such as frustration or boredom, and they can also be an artefact of previous poor welfare. For example, in utero stress can cause brain dysfunction, which is one of the potential causes of ARBs. They can also be indicative of medical conditions. Seizures and GI problems have been connected to fly snapping, also hallucinations due to eye problems with light and shadow chasing, and tail chasing can also be due to general pain with the back and tail region. ARBs are also distressing to the dogs and their owners, and that can increase the risk of inappropriate punishment, relinquishment, and sometimes behavioural euthanasia. ARBs can also interfere with a dog's normal activities. In one study, there was a dog that was unable to eat properly or sleep properly without the owner holding them due to their tail chasing. Generally, the risk factors for ARBs ARBs in dogs are still quite poorly understood and the forms are often pulled together and it has been seen previously in mink that there were different risk factors for different forms so therefore it may be the same in dogs. The findings are also often conflicting and disagree with each other. The prevalence of ARBs in dogs is also still largely unknown. A recent study in Finland found that 
16% of the dogs in their study were affected with a sample size of 3,700. So if you compare that to the UK dog population, which is 10.2 million, that means there could be potentially over 160,000 effective dogs in the UK alone. Finally, ARBs are often poorly recognised by owners or they're not perceived as a problem. In a study looking at tail chasing videos on YouTube, 59% of people were laughing at the dog in the video showing the behaviour and the behaviour was described as funny by the commenters. The main aim of this study was to identify the risk factors for two visually mediated ARB forms, light and shadow chasing and fly snapping, and one locomotory ARB form, tail chasing. As well as hoping to find novel risk factors, we also aim to confirm previously discovered risk factors for the ARB forms, including breed predispositions, early life environment and current environment. We also aim to compare the risk factors for visually mediated ARBs and locomotory ARBs as they are different forms and it has previously been seen that the risk factors can differ for the different forms and therefore they may require different treatment. Light and shadow chasing is defined as the chasing, stalking, staring or biting of shadows, lights or reflections for longer than 30 seconds per episode. You can see in the video that the dog is chasing the lights and the shadows and snapping at them and running after them. Fly snapping is categorised by sudden, occasional or continuous episodes of biting the air without flies present, which may be accompanied by jumping, licking or swallowing. And you can see that the dog in the video is showing classic signs of fly snapping with the licking and the snapping. Tail chasing is defined as the chasing of the tail or walking in circles or spinning on the spot more than three times in a row, as demonstrated by the dog in the video. The hypotheses in our study can be split into four categories, starting with breed grouping. We had hypotheses related to the selection for sensory capacities over appearance in pastoral dogs, as well as pastoral dogs with lower levels of enrichment showing higher levels of ARBs. We also had a hypothesis surrounding early life environment, dogs that were from a non-home-based breeder or potentially a puppy mill or were from a rescue environment where they were kenneled would be more likely to show an ARB. We had several hypotheses surrounding current environment including ones about higher levels of cognitive and physical enrichment meaning dogs are less likely to show an ARB. Also that spending time crated puts dogs more at risk and that dogs that are housed with other conspecifics are less at risk of an ARB. We also had several hypotheses surrounding health and that diagnosis of certain medical conditions increased the risk of showing an ARB. So this was dogs with a seizure history are more likely to fly snap and dogs with ocular disorders or visual impairment are more likely to show either light and shadow chasing or fly snapping. The questionnaire was developed using previous research and previously identified risk factors. We also asked more thorough and wide-reaching questions to explore novel predictors and risk factors. The questionnaire was split into sections starting with background. We first asked questions about owner demographics and then moving on to the dog collecting general information about age, sex, neuter status, breed. We then asked questions about relevant health history, neurological conditions, so seizures or ophthalmic disease. We then asked about early life experience experiences, the breeding environment, or whether they were a rescue, and then we moved on to current lifestyle, so their enrichment provision and their social environment. There were then questions about each ARB behaviour, the presentation, the reinforcement history, and potential triggers for the behaviour. The questionnaire was online and it was presented through SurveyMonkey. It was a convenience sample and we recruited through online snowball sampling. We also had leaflets at Crofts in 2022 and an email was sent out to the Pandemic Puppy RVC mailing list for people that were interested in future research, as well as circulated internally at the RVC. When it came to do the data analysis, we did include some derived variables from other sources, including the International Veterinary Epilepsy Task Force Turing System, which splits the dogs with seizures by severity. We also included skull shape and brachycephalic severity from Vet Compass, as well as body and brain weights of the purebred dogs. I also developed an enrichment scoring chart as we had asked owners about the activities their dogs participated in and how frequently. We then had professionals from the dog behaviour industry score these activities based based on their physical and cognitive enrichment. We then gave each activity an overall score. Finally, we included breed groupings from the Kennel Club, the FCI, and some genetic breed groupings from previous studies. To ensure the dogs properly met the definition of having the ARB, we made an inclusion criteria, where the dogs were considered based on the frequency of the behaviour, the length of the episode, and whether it interfered with their daily life. Also, for fly snapping, it included whether flies were present or not. The data was then cleaned in Python, analysed in our studio, and binomial generalised linear models were run against the inclusion criteria for each ARB outcome. After the data was cleaned, I received 2,619 usable responses from 51 countries.
countries. The majority of the respondents were female and half of the respondents were in the 45 to 64 age category. Within the dogs, 53.5% of dogs were male, 69.1% of them were neutered and the median age was five years. After the inclusion criteria was applied, ARBs were reported in 13.6% of dogs in my study and ARBs of any form were most prevalent in Border Collies, Cocker Spaniels and Labrador Retrievers. The map on the slide shows the survey respondents and their corresponding countries and the marker on each country was dictated by the number of respondents from that country. The most popular country was the United Kingdom with 86.4% of participants, which was to be expected. The second most popular was the US with 5.8% of participants. They did also get respondents from some further afield countries such as Japan, Sri Lanka, Serbia and Guatemala. In our study, both of the significant risk factors for light and shadow chasing were due to current environment. They were spending the majority of the daytime crated and living in a household with cats. Crate restricting a dog for the majority of the day may cause emotional distress and frustration due to reduced social interaction with their owners as dogs are selected for human interaction. It also restricts their ability to move within their home environment, which is a natural behaviour. Both emotional stress and frustration can lead to ARB development. This finding supported our hypothesis surrounding dogs that spend the majority of the time crated are more at risk of developing an ARB. Our finding about living in a household with cats being a significant risk factor for light and shadow chasing is a novel finding, but light and shadow chasing has previously been hypothesised to be related to dogs chasing prey or other objects, and dogs, especially those with an exaggerated chase drive, may find cats in the household a trigger for the light and shadow chasing. Spending the majority of the daytime crated or contained was also a significant risk factor for fly snapping. Having a brachycephalic skull shape was also a significant risk factor for fly snapping in our study, which is a novel finding. This may be because brachycephalic dogs are predisposed to many serious health disorders and therefore may have more comorbidities with health conditions that can cause ARBs, such as eye disorders and breathing impairment. Brachycephalic dogs are 20 times more likely to suffer from corneal ulceration than non-brachycephalic breeds, which can cause scarring and visual impairment. Visual impairment in humans can cause complex hallucinations, so it is conceivable that brachycephalic dogs may experience the same hallucinations and then the resultant visually mediated ARBs, such as fly snapping, from their progressive corneal damage. Unfortunately, dogs cannot self-report hallucinations, so we aren't able to confirm that. Brachycephalic dogs can also have complications from brachycephalic airway obstructive syndrome, or BOAS, such as acute hypoxia, and in humans, hypoxia can cause behavioural changes such as hallucinations and anxiety. So again, these dogs may be suffering with hypoxia and therefore hallucinations, but again, unfortunately, we aren't able to ask them about this as they cannot self-report hallucinations. In the bottom right corner of the slide you can see on the left hand side a mesocephalic skull and on the right hand side a brachycephalic skull and you can see the difference in the length of the snout. The brachycephalic one is significantly shorter than the mesocephalic. There were also some health related risk factors for fly snapping in our study. The first one is seizures which has been seen in previous studies. In humans with epilepsy psychosis potentially accompanied by hallucinations is quite common and again obviously dogs can cannot self-report hallucinations, but it may explain why dogs with a history of seizures are more likely to fly snap, as it is a hallucinatory ARB. A study of fly snapping dogs found that on EEGs, recordings of brain activity, that the epileptic discharges were most localised in the occipital lobes, the part of the brain that is primarily responsible for visual processing, which could also explain why dogs with a history of seizures are more at risk of fly snapping behaviours. Our study also found eye problems to be a significant risk factor for fly snapping behaviour, something that has never been confirmed, but it has been hypothesised that dogs may fly snap due to floating opacities that they are attempting to catch. Visual impairment was also a risk factor for fly snapping in our study. Visually impaired humans can get something called Charles Bonnet syndrome, which is a condition that can cause hallucinations. It is thought that the hallucinations may be caused by abnormal neuronal activity that is usually suppressed by visual sensory input. It's therefore plausible that visually impaired dogs may experience something similar and therefore similar hallucinations causing the fly snapping. These three risk factors also support our hypothesis surrounding medical conditions increasing the risk of an ARB, particularly ocular disorder or visual impairment for fly snapping. Spending the majority of the nighttime crated was a significant risk factor for tail chasing. Being crated for significant periods of time was a risk factor for all three ARB forms. A dog's social environment was also shown to influence tail chasing behaviours, as dogs that were housed with larger numbers of other dogs in their household were less at risk of tail chasing behaviours. It has been suggested that being housed with other dogs reduces frustration and boredom, which are both things that can otherwise lead to ARB development. This finding supports other studies and also our hypothesis that dogs that are housed with other dogs are less at risk of showing an ARB. Overall enrichment was also a significant predictor of dogs showing less tail chasing behaviours. Enrichment has previously been hypothesised to reduce boredom and increase the amount of stimulation a dog is provided with, therefore reducing the amount of ARB behaviours shown. Again, this supports previous studies and also
also our hypothesis that high levels of cognitive and physical enrichment put dogs less at risk of an ARB. Younger dogs in our study were also more at risk of tail chasing behaviours and this is thought to be due to hormonal changes in puberty triggering tail chasing. The onset of tail chasing is most common between the ages of three and six months and dogs undergo puberty between six and 16 months depending on the sex and the breed, therefore suggesting that hormonal changes associated with puberty may trigger tail chasing behaviours. The FCI breed grouping sheep dogs and cattle dogs was also more at risk of showing an ARB when they were compared to the scent hounds breed group. The FCI sheep dog and cattle dog breed grouping includes a few working breeds who are often bred for athleticism and high energy and they need high levels of exercise and stimulation and if this is lacking it may be why they are developing more tail chasing behaviours. Having a lower brain weight and therefore a lower total brain volume was also a significant risk factor for showing tail chasing behaviours. Studies on mice have found that the mice with the lower total brain volume were more likely to exhibit locomotory ARBs so it is possible that this is applicable to dogs but further research would be needed. Chiari-like malformation and comorbid syringomyelia is often common in smaller dogs such as King Charles Spaniels, Yorkshire Terriers, French Bulldogs and Pomeranians and syringomyelia is a painful spinal cord disease that can lead to neuropathic pain and anxiety in dogs. Pain and anxiety can both be predictors for the development of ARBs. Having a lower brain weight has been seen previously in mice but this is a novel finding in dogs and something that would require further research. Overall our study has shown that the risk factors for the ARBs are multifactorial and current environment is significant for all the three forms. Current environment health and breed grouping were also significant for fly snapping and tail chasing. We have also shown that the risk factors do differ between visually mediated and locomotory ARBs as there was only one consistent risk factor throughout all of the three forms and that was spending a prolonged amount of time created or contained. We also confirmed previous studies as they had seen that spending large amounts of time created was a significant risk factor for ARB development. We also confirmed the importance of higher levels of enrichment and showing fewer ARB behaviours. We also discovered novel risk factors for all three ARB forms. For light and shadow chasing, living with cats was a novel risk factor. For fly snapping, it was the discovery of the brachycephalic skull shape and for tail chasing, it was the lower brain weight. Our results also suggest that treatment and prevention advice for canine ARBs should be form specific and the results highlight the importance to canine welfare of identifying the risk factors for the different ARB forms. I'd just like to say a few thank yous before I finish. Firstly to my supervisors Rowena and Maria for all their support, kindness and patience with some of my dodgy time management. Also all the owners and dogs who participated as this study would not have been possible without them. And I think maybe most importantly is my dogs Boris, Kito, Rosa and Molly pictured here. Without them I would have never have discovered my passion for all things dog. Thank you for listening. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you very much, Olivia. If you would like to pop your camera on. Hi. Hello. Hello. Thank you. That was a brilliant talk. And again, you've been very popular. Uh, so we might have to fill some of these on Slack. Uh, but starting off, um, you mentioned a lot about living with cats as a predictor of ARBs. Did the uh, shadow chasing dogs show any chasing behaviour of the cats they lived with? What did the owners report? And what relationship did the dogs have with the cats? So we didn't necessarily directly look at the relationship. The inclusion for living with the cats just was they were also present in the household. Um, they were, I didn't actually ask whether they were chasing the cats specifically. That would have been something that would have been really interesting to look at. It was more the way we looked at it was potentially that the presence of the cats generally was potentially causing the light and shadow chasing but no we didn't look further into the relationships it would have been something that would have been really interesting but we were quite time limited unfortunately as it was a master's project no that, that's fine yes time time management always important in uh, asking a question like that thank you um the next question that's coming is is a similar vein another potential predictor um is there a possibility that certain breeds are more likely to be created and so a possible confound confound sorry between breed and creating effects is is there a confound there with creating yeah. some breeds of dogs? Mm -hmm. I think that would be something that would be really interesting to look at I definitely have the data available to do that obviously it would take further um, analysis but I could imagine just kind of colloquially that potentially some some of your more high drive dogs um, are probably more likely to be created your bigger dogs are often more likely to be created as well and I think there's also a bit of a cultural shift as well that I know in the US it's quite common especially to create again bigger dogs high drive dogs things like that so there could definitely 
be some sort of compounding effect between the two and it would be quite interesting actually to run the analysis between the breeds and whether that was then they're being created to see whether it makes a difference. Okay, thank you. Yeah, a, a reasonable thing to go on and study in the future. Um, and then one final question. Uh, we had a question come through about owner perception of abnormal repetitive behaviours. Do you mm -hmm. think that sometimes owners think these behaviours are funny, potentially reward that behaviour and therefore are causing a welfare problem in itself by doing that? Yeah, I, I think definitely, as we've seen from the study done by Charlie Byrne, they obviously people do find tail chasing particularly funny. We actually did ask questions about reinforcement behaviours, but again, we were time limited, so it'd be something interesting to look at in the future. But it does seem that people do often do think it's funny and it all links back to the lack of awareness surrounding ARBs generally, I think. And I think it's particularly tail chasing. People think it's very funny. We see it quite frequently. They're like, oh, he's having fun. He's trying to chase his tail. It's like a fun little game for him. So then, yeah, reinforce it without necessarily thinking about it. And I think that then reduces the quality of life as you see there's that dog that isn't able to eat or sleep without the owner holding it and whether he'd been reinforced previously obviously we can't know but I think it definitely is a welfare issue and I think it all stems to owner perceptions quite frequently. Thank you very much so a bit more owner education and awareness. Thank Olivia you. that was brilliant so yeah as I said you've been very popular so I hope you can pop into the, the Slack channel for extra questions. Uh, but we will move on to the next talk now so thank you thank you so, um, the next talk is all about uh, parrots and whether or not flight restriction impacts a welfare in parrots and this is by emma meller hi everyone my name's emma and i'm going to be speaking to you today about some of my postdoctoral research um, and in this project we were interested in whether restricting flight leads to welfare problems in parrots. Um, this piece of research was kindly funded by U4 and it finished last year. So there's the outline for the talk that I'm going to be presenting to you today. Um, I just want to point out at the outset that there are two sort of arms to this research. Um, we were asking our research question using a comparative study and then also an epidemiological study too. Um, so just bearing that in mind when um, we get to the methods section of my talk and my results. So flight is probably one of the most constrained natural behaviours for captive birds that can fly. Um, and in parrots, flight might be constrained in one or two ways or maybe a mix of them. Um, so it can be spatially restricted via the confines of the cage, but then also physically restricted, um, typically via wind trimming in this uh, particular taxonomic group. And we know that frustration of behavioural needs can cause welfare problems. So I've given you two examples there, um, and the one that I'm going to just rattle through now is with relation to parrots. So we know that there's certain foraging modes, these effortful foraging modes, that when these animals can't perform the same behaviours in captivity, it compromises their welfare. And so our focus here is on whether flight might also be an important behavioural need, because if so, then its restriction might help explain some of the welfare problems that we see in this taxonomic group. So why did we focus on parrots? So I've given you the reasons up there on the slide. So there's important species differences in reliance on flight and also in welfare. And then thinking ahead to our epidemiological study, there's also within species differences in housing. So those first three bullet points, what I'm getting at is that there's a central variation there for hypothesis testing. The fourth reason is also quite practical. Um, so these species are really popular in captivity. So there's been estimates done that about half of the global population of um, parrots are in captivity. And that equates to something around 50 million birds within each context. So 50 million in the wild, 50 million in captivity. So there's lots of opportunity to collect those really important between and within species data points. So might flight be a behavioural need that varies in welfare importance between species? So there is some support for this idea. So this comes from the fact that within a, this taxonomic group, there's variation in how much species use flight. 
So we have examples of migratory species, and I've pulled up two there for you, the orange belly parrot and the swift parrot. Others are resident and sedentary and sort of stick in one place. And then we actually have examples of a flightless parrot too, the kakapo um, in the bottom corner. Um, and then other species that likewise spend quite a long time on the ground, uh, the ground parrot being um, another example there. We see some support from experimental studies. So these authors found evidence of rebound activity when budgerigars were moved from small to large aviaries. And they took this to mean that that flight motivation was being frustrated in those small aviaries. And then also some support from observational studies. So restrictive flight was found to be a risk factor for stereotypic behaviour. So those repetitive behaviours that are indicative of compromised welfare. So I think it's reasonable to say that potentially, yes, flight might be a behavioural need. And then having that restricted in captivity for those species that fly a lot might therefore compromise their welfare. So these practices like keeping parrots in spatially restricted spaces like cages um, and physically preventing flight via practices like wing trimming, for certain species, those more flight reliant species could therefore create these evolutionary mismatches between their um, wild evolved conditions and the captive conditions and create welfare problems. Which leads us to our research question. So does restricting flight lead to welfare problems in parrots? And we tackle this in two ways. So we use phylogenetic comparative methods to test that hypothesis that species differences in flight reliance help explain species differences in welfare. And then we also use epidemiology to explore individual level effects of flight opportunities on one welfare outcome, which is feather damaging behaviour, which we'll look at in a couple of slides. For our comparative study, we collated data on four wild biology predictor variables that describe species typical flight reliance. So these are proxies that are trying to get at how much a species uses flight in the wild. The first one was a biometric one, so that's the hand wing index, which is a really commonly used proxy for flight reliance in the literature and describes wingtip pointedness. And so migratory species um, and species that disperse far, but also species that use flight a lot on a daily basis. So things like hummingbirds, they have narrower and pointier wings than species that use flight less. The second one was species typical movements. And that was a categorical variable that class species as to whether or not it made regular movements. So things like migrants, semi-migrants and nomads versus sedentary species that were resident and just sort of stuck in one place. The third one was island endemism, so another categorical variable, um, and this is whether or not a species was restricted to oceanic islands, or only found on oceanic islands, or whether it was found on the mainland too. And the assumption underlying this variable is that if you're restricted to oceanic islands, then you're physically restricted in how far you can fly, so presumably you use flight a bit less than something that's found on the mainland. The fourth one was reliance on trees for foraging, and this was a percentage reliance. And the assumption underpinning this variable was that if you are an off the ground forager, so if you use shrubs and trees, then you're using flight to get to those spaces. Um, so on a daily basis, presumably you're using flight more than something that forages from the ground. For our comparative study, we use five welfare sensitive outcome variables from three different sources. The first one was hatch rates of birds in aviculture. So you might notice that this data source is quite dated now. Um, the survey though was never updated or replicated. So this remains the most relevant and up-to-date source of its type for us to get a reproductive measure um, for bird, for captive parrots. And we actually validated this source more recently in a comparative paper. So we got an expert to rank the same species according to how difficult they're they are to breed nowadays um, and we found really good agreements between the two sources so even though these are old we think they're still relevant to birds today and in these models to control for natural differences in reproductive output we included wild fecundity in the models our second outcome for our comparative study were relative lifespans of zoo house parrots so these came from two different sources the first paper in the first bullet point reported species typical lifespans of parrots of zoos. And then to be able to make meaningful comparisons across these species, 
we express these as a proportion of a given species maximum recorded lifespan. So just to illustrate what that means, values closest to what to zero means that that species dies relatively young in zoos, and then values closer to one means that individuals from that species typically live really close to their species typical maximum. Our third type of outcome variable for our comparative study was species typical stereotypic behaviour prevalence. Um, we split these into three sort of distinct forms. So these were FDB, feather damaging behaviour, which we're going to look at in a minute, whole body forms of stereotypic behaviour, and then non-feather related oral stereotypic behaviour. So these are behaviours that don't involve feathers, but still involve the beak or the tongue. Uh, these were calculated from survey responses from pet parrot owners, and they answered our really quite extensive survey and gave us loads of information about their birds, rearing conditions, and living conditions, and whether or not they had stereotypic behaviours. And then after processing, we were left with these stereotypic behaviour outcome variables, but then also additional variables describing key population characteristics that we controlled for where necessary in the models. So things like whether or not a bird could fly in its current home. So here I've just given you a couple of examples of what parrot stereotypic behaviours look like. So I'm going to start with the video. So this is a parrot that's housed in a lab and it's root tracing. So this for us is a type of whole body stereotypic behaviour. And you can see it's just going round and round and round. And these lab birds, they can devote like high proportions of their uh, active waking days to performing these behaviours. And then moving on to the grey parrot on the right hand side, this bird's showing the effects of this feather damage behaviour, FDB. Um, and typically in parrots, it's self-directed. Um, so this bird has chewed and plucked out its own feathers. Um, obviously, this is really this is a serious welfare concern for the bird itself, but it's really distressing for pet owners too. And then for our epidemiological study, we used those individual level parrot survey responses. And we focused on two focal predictor variables, whether or not a bird could fly during its first year of life, yes versus no, and also whether it could fly in the current home, again, yes versus no. And if flight is important to welfare, then we predict that being able to fly during early life and or currently should be protective against welfare problems. And we use a model building approach to model FDB status for our four best sampled species. Now for our stats. So for our comparative study, we use phylogenetic generalised least squares in the CAPER package in R. And what this does is it builds in the shape of the phylogenetic tree of the species into its analysis. So it controls for the fact that those species data points can't be considered statistically independent because species are related to one another to a greater or lesser extent. So it controls for that hierarchical structure in the data. And then for our epidemiological study, we use mixed effects models, likewise in R. And for our results, for our comparative study, we found no support for our flight related hypothesis. So those species differences and flight reliance did not predict welfare in the way that we were expecting. And none of our wild flight predictive variables explained any of the variation in captive hatch rates or in relative lifespans. But against predictions, we found that island dwelling species, so those species that are restricted to oceanic islands, have more prevalent FDB and also more prevalent whole body stereotypic behaviour. And again, for our epidemiological study, we found a similar effect. So our flight related hypothesis was not supported and neither of our focal flight predictors predicted FDB status. Although we did identify other demographic and environmental risk factors for FDB. So things like species identity, but also enrichment provision during the first year of life. So it seems like making sure that birds are well enriched when they're young means that they're less prone to developing FDB in later life. To sum up, so we robustly found no support for our flight related hypothesis across both studies. So at least it was consistent. Um, and I think what we can say is that based on our results, flight does not seem to be a highly motivated behavioural need. We can't totally rule out that our flight predictors just didn't function very well as proxies. And even if it isn't a behavioural need, flight might provide benefits in other ways. 
so via exercise opportunities, which might be really important to captive birds in providing health benefits. So things like protection against heart disease and obesity. But I think one thing that it is important to point out is that our results do not mean that it's therefore acceptable, based on the grounds of flight restriction anyway, to keep birds in cramped conditions or subject them to practices that might cause them harm. And based on our comparative findings, we can make some useful recommendations. So this is one of the great things about this sort of cross-species comparative approach, is being able to make welfare relevant recommendations based on your findings, based on identification of biological risk factors. So based on our results, what we would say, for most people, we would recommend not keeping island dwellers as pets. And this is because their welfare needs are hard to facilitate um, when they're in captivity. And another great thing about comparative studies is that we can extrapolate beyond the species that we had outcome variable data for. And so we suggest that other island dwelling species would also be at risk of developing stereotypic behaviours in captivity. And I've pulled out three, these three here because we didn't have um, stereotypic behaviour outcome data for them, but we know that they're island restricted island dwelling species. So our island dwelling result, um, that island dwellers are more prone to abnormal behaviour, might link with a previously identified biological risk factor for stereotypic behaviour that we found in uh, a previous comparative study. Um, and the reason why I think these two things might link is that island dwellers have relatively larger, slower developing brains than their mainland counterparts. And so there might be something going on there. And overall, our results highlight broad types of species, demographics and living conditions that place birds at risk. So going forward, what's next? Um, I'd love to know what might explain species differences in relative lifespan. There's loads of variation there, so I've given you the range up there so you can see for yourself how much variation is there. And I think this would be best tackled with um, another comparative study, but looking at a broader range of bi potential biological risk factors. Is there a link with flight restriction um, and health outcomes like obesity? And then trying to unpick that intelligence and island end endemism risk factors. Do they link? And then I just want to touch on something that sort of got churned out of our epidemiological study. So in our previous comparative work, we've always, because they're semi-domesticated, left cockatiels and budrigars too out of our comparative work. But we plugged them back into our epidemiological study because we were looking at those individual level effects. And by doing that, we found that 48% of cockatiels are affected by whole body stereotypic behaviour. And actually, that's the highest prevalence across the entire study. But this species is generally considered a good pet species. So I think it has to draw sort of question marks over that status. And so I'd like to know what's going on here with the cockatiels and their welfare. And with that, I have some thank yous to make. So I'm going to pull out two main ones. I'm going to say a massive thank you to our survey respondents for giving us their time and effort and giving us information about their birds so we can do our research. And then I also owe massive thanks to you for too for funding this. Emma, thank you very much. That was excellent. If you would like to come on view, that would be brilliant. Hello. Hi, how are you? Very well, thank you. Thank you for the summary of, of your research, as interesting as ever. Thank you. A couple of questions uh, for you, Emma. This is one um, that I'm just interested in terms of a kind of a methodological approach. I really like the fact that you use an old data set. Mm. How did you go about validating it? So you said there was an expert. How did you validate yeah. the expert's view of the old data set, if that makes sense? Yeah, we just looked at the relationship between the two. So um, we just like regressed one against the other and found agreement that way. Um, so we got this, we got this expert, to, we gave her a list of the species and then got her to rank them according to whether or not they were easy to breed in captivity or still hard to breed in captivity. My recollection is it ended up being like on an ordinal scale, uh, I think from zero through to three or two. Um, and we, yeah, we validated it that way. Yeah, unfortunately we found, like I said, really good agreement. Um, so it does give us some confidence that those old data are still relevant and still useful. 
Um, obviously, the ideal situation would be to get more recent data, um, but without that, this seems to be a good alternative still. So, reassuring. Um, and then we've also had a question about cockatiels, which I think you kind of mm -hmm. threw in at the end there, but was really fascinating. Yeah. Most people think of the cockatiels and budgies as kind of an entry level to bird keeping. So do you think these welfare problems are down to poor owner knowledge of husbandry and requirements? I mean, who knows? It's not something we can like really readily sort of like pull out with this current study. Um, it'd be something that I'd really, really like to look into because it could be similar to the dogs that owners just aren't realising potentially what these strange behaviours might mean in their birds. Um, you know, I'm just throwing out ideas here, but it'd be really interesting, I think, to take that forward and just try and assess what's going on. There are small species, so maybe people think, oh, well, I live in a flat, so I haven't got much space, so I could just, but I want to keep a bird. Um, maybe I can just get a cockatiel because that can just stay on its own and live on its own. Um, so maybe these sort of like welfare problems or potential welfare problems feed into that. Um, yeah, I appreciate it was a bit of a random one at the end of my talk because it had nothing really to do with the research question, but it was something I was really quite shocked when I did the calculation and realised how prevalent whole body stereotypic behaviours were in that particular species. So yeah, I'd like to see someone backing up on that. Thank you. And then uh, just one very quick question right at the end. Since the impact of flight restriction, i.e. the space that the bird had, has that been looked at in relation to species being bred for reintroduction programmes and re-release schemes? So, for example, Spix's macaw. Yeah, that's a really good question. And the answer is, I don't know. So I'm sorry to finish on such a rubbish answer. <laughs> that's a very good question. But yeah, it's not something I know, I'm afraid. Well, you've also been very popular, Emma. So if you are able to um, go into the Slack and field any further questions, that would be brilliant. But thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. Thank you. So, folks, we now move on to the short talks for this afternoon. So these are three minutes long. They're all going to run um, concurrently and we'll bring the speakers back at the end, ask them to pop um, their videos and microphones on and then we'll answer their, ask them their questions. So thank you very much and enjoy this session of short talks. Hi everyone, my name is Mona Hirsberg and in this pitch I will introduce you to Best Practice Hens, which is a pilot project to support the transition to cage-free housing systems for hens in the European Union. In the EU, all laying hens should be housed in furnished cages or cage-free systems. However, even in furnished cages, laying hens have limited space and behavioral opportunities. As there is considerable variation in the uptake of cage-free systems among EU countries, the Best Practice Hands project aims to help egg producers by providing practical guidance on how to transition to cage-free systems. Our project combines input from experts from countries that already have a high percentage of cage-free systems, which we call cage-free countries, and experts from countries that are still transitioning, which we call target countries. We started to collect information by reviewing the scientific literature, and these results were supplemented by information from management guides, interviews with experts from the egg industry and governments in the cage-free countries. We further took into account the local situation in the target countries and discussed our information with stakeholders at EU level. This resulted in a final set of best practices for keeping pullets and laying hands in cage-free systems. Based on these best practices, we created various dissemination materials in seven languages, such as uh, practice abstracts on different topics, a protocol for practical welfare assessment, professional video clips, and smartphone videos. These materials are mainly targeted at bullet rearers and egg producers, but they are also useful for veterinarians, advisors, or students who are interested in learning best practices for keeping hands in cage-free systems. We took these materials with us and organized dissemination events in the target countries and the final event at the Commission in Brussels, of which you can still watch the recordings. The good thing is that also the dissemination materials are still freely available for everyone. You can access them on our website. Thank you for your attention.
Hello, we are presenting the adaptation of the CAT stress score for use in hospitalized cats. As we are more aware of stress in cats, we know that veterinary environment can be a huge source and we talk about micro, macro and anthropogenic sources that can induce it. Regarding stress evaluation in cats, we can use physiological parameters or behavioral parameters and CAT stress score is a scale of 11 elements and 7 tiers that evaluate it by behavior and postures on the cat. The goal of our study is to effectively use CAT stress score to know if 30 second evaluation would be representative of their distress, to compare phalangry maze scale with CAT stress score and to determine the levels and scale elements needed to assess stress with a minimal loss of reliability. So in the end, we want to transform CAT stress score into a scale that assesses stress in a practical, easy and effective way. We used a sample of 54 cats that were not under the effect of drugs that would affect their behavior. We used phalangry maze scale and cat stress score in a standardized way and we collected 54 30 seconds video and 10 10 minutes video and we used the statistical tools that we see here. Regarding the first results, the 30 seconds video, we found uh, excellent reliability between observations with 99 of intercalized correlation coefficient. Regarding the first scale simplification, we reduced for 7 to 3 tiers the levels of observation. And when comparing both scales, the modified and the original one, we found that they were identical uh, regarding uh, stress observation with less overlapping of information and subjectivity, so a simplified scale. Regarding cat stress score and phalangry maze scale uh, correlation, we found a weak correlation with non-statistically uh, significant results. Regarding the elements evaluation, we found by the PCA diagram that using a scale of with three tiers and six elements was reliable, so it would be easiest to use with less information overlay and less extensive, so a better tool to implement on uh, veterinary environments. So in the end, we find that the cat stress score modified as an effective tool to assess hospitalized cat distress that would be uh, straightforward, user-friendly and efficient in their use. So it would be a tool to help clinicians to, uh, to give a stress-low environment in veterinary practice. So it would improve everyone's welfare. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lisa Holmes, Lead Conservation Scientist for Behaviour and Welfare at Chester Zoo, and today we'll be talking to you about an applied research project focusing on Komodo dragons. Reptiles rely on their environment to regulate their core body temperature, and for many species in naturalistic settings, this would be directly from sunlight. Body temperature is regulated by the animals as they change position and location throughout the day. Thermoregulation is vital for physiological processes and in captive settings we have a responsibility to ensure we provide suitable housing conditions which enable animals to not only reach optimal body temperature but also maintain it. The welfare assessment process for species such as Komodo dragons includes monitoring environmental parameters as well as body condition and temperature. However, there is currently no standardised way of estimating core body temperature with a range of equipment available. Over the past few years, many zoos have been changing their heating and lighting to better replicate the natural conditions. The move from long wave to short wave heat sources allows for a deeper warming effect through to the muscle compared to heating just the epidermis, and this better enables thermoregulation. Measurements of body temperature therefore need to take into account likely differences between the surface of the skin and core body temperature. Some of the methodologies described here are more invasive, such as cloacal measurements or surgically implanted radio transmitters. Therefore, many keepers use external temperature recording devices, such as infrared thermometers or thermal image cameras, to estimate body temperature, but this really only provides an estimate of surface temperature. For our project, we validated three of the most common pieces of equipment used by zookeepers. Our adult male and female dragons were fed a small eye button data logger in a piece of meat just before consumption of their regular carcass feed to measure internal temperature. 
The data logger passes through the gut after five days, and for each of those days we observe behaviour, use of basking areas, and measure external temperature. All of the data was then statistically analysed against internal temperature measurements. The results showed all three external devices produced a degree of variation, but this can be improved by measuring temperature from a consistent distance and location on the mid-torso. We applied a correction factor for all three devices and heat sources against core temperature and developed a web-based interface for keepers to input their external temperature readings and better estimate core body temperature to make more informed management decisions. I'd like to thank my fellow authors, the fantastic Chester Zoo Reptile team and European Collections who are working on this project to provide further validation. Thank you for listening. Good afternoon, I'm Lloyd, one of the great ape keepers at Twycross Zoo in the UK, and today I'll be discussing our approach to chimpanzee social management and how we negotiate the ethos of restricted intervention, or RI, to inform the routine care and welfare of our large mixed sex community of chimpanzees. So in theory, RI is relatively simple. Its aim is to emulate nature's model by facilitating political agency within large mixed sex communities restricting the influence of humans on social development and ensuring that routine care practices adapt to the chimpanzee's sociality. Simple, however, chimpanzees are not, especially those aging individuals who have decades-long experiences of intensive human interaction and intervention, seasoned to having their social needs met by keepers. RI lies in stark contrast to the once predominant practice of managing zoo house chimpanzees in small groups of a male and a few females, where male-male sociality was deprived and sociality was effectively predetermined by humans through carefully curating age and sex ratios. Adapting to a dramatically reduced social provision by keepers remains challenging and a significant cultural shift for the community. For example, certain community members still actively seek human companionship and turn to keepers for social reassurance in times of conflict. Many individuals in the community were human raised as infants and have traumatic experiences of wild capture and mother infant separations from the 1960s and 70s. Under RI, knowing whether or not to offer reassurance when a, when a chimpanzee asks for it is a tremendously difficult line to toe, given that it is we as humans who have fostered such an expectation in the first place. But I would argue that it is the culture of the management practice that is more important. To demonstrate, if we consider two chimpanzees in the community, Coco and Kibali, whose life histories could not be more different and have equally different expectations from us as keepers, Coco will often seek reassurance from keepers, while Kibali will do so exclusively from within the community. At the age of 58, Coco is extremely unlikely to change her expectation of us. However, the integrity of the community's expectation of keepers remains intact, exemplified by Kibali. Coco's confidence in obtaining reassurances from other members has also improved dramatically due to the changed cultural expectation of the community as a whole. Over the past 10 years, the community has shown a profound and potentially therapeutic response to greater social agency and jurisdiction, even among those most accustomed to intensive human interaction and intervention. While there is undoubtedly no uniform approach to chimpanzee social management, the relative success of converting to the RI method at Twycross Zoo represents an interesting case study given the community status as both an aging community and its diverse life experiences. Thank you for listening and I welcome any Thank you very much. If we could have Mona, Yao, Lisa and Lloyd pop their cameras on, that would be brilliant. Hi Mona. Hi Lisa. Hi. Hi Yao. And Lloyd, thank you very much. There's an excellent set of talks on a very diverse array of topics. Um, so there are a couple of questions that have come through um, for all speakers. So uh, Mona, I'll start with you. In terms of the app-based technologies that you developed, do you see this as something that we should roll out 
more widely for animal welfare assessment? Does it increase uptake with good animal welfare principles? Yeah, I'm not sure if I get the question directly. So is it about outface technology used in those uh, gate-free systems or? Uh, yeah, yes. yeah. Um, that's very important because our project is also called best practices. So um, we really um, yeah, dive into the scientific liter literature, but also in uh, technical guides and um, also um, did interviews with experts so to assure that uh, we do not uh, recommend minimum standards for cage-free systems, but really the best practices. So, so really, what should you do if you have such a cage-free system? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and then I'll, I'll move on to um, Yao. I hope, I'm, I hope I'm saying your name right. Apologies if not. Um, the simplification of your tool, has that increased its uptake widely across veterinary practices? Well, good question, and thank you very much. Well, uh, it is not still um, published, so used in veterinary practice, but regarding the use that we performed on clinicians, we found that the original CAT stress score was pretty um, complicated for them to use. It was not standardized, and it was lots of correlation on levels. So uh, usually it induced a repulse on most clinicians, and this uh, simplified version was easiest to teach, and they were able to, um, to prevent them from getting really fearful or aggressive. So what I found is that they started learning how to use it and then asking for help or for other tools for them to avoid being in a, in a bad welfare situation. Okay, thank you. So is there a plan to publish it more widely yeah. eventually? Yeah. Yes, right now we are still developing other um, other statistical tools to, to, to know that it is objective and reliable in all situations with different levels of uh, scholarship or, or advanced studies even on veterinary nurses to know if it's well used to be to be published or if there is some kind of adaptation so this was the first test and we made with different uh, people with three people um, and we performed randomized evaluation and what we found is that in this point we are in the good uh, we have we have a good result so yes the, the idea is that during this year it will be published so yes you'll get more data thank you very much um lisa i'll come to you next and there's a couple of questions on a similar vein so if, if i mangle this completely i do apologize so you've used this quite regularly with this one species are you now considering it for other species as well and has the Komodo dragon, because of its sort of size and stature, been a really useful, I suppose, introduction to these kind of measurements because it's kind of helped your data collection, as it were? Yeah, I mean, it would be it would be great to apply this to other species, but of course, trying to get those internal temperatures is really difficult. So for some of the smaller reptiles, then we might be able to get those cloacal measurements to get that core body temperature. Um, but for Komodo dragons, yes, there's some published data from the wild. Some very brave soul did this about 40 years ago with wild dragons. Um, so it's it's we want to try and minimize that you know impact on the keepers and also make sure that the data that we're getting is really useful and um, so starting with the dragons has been really good because we know there are problems with um, the way they're managed in captivity and so by working with the the EP coordinators and the tag we're able to then advise on how we manage them right across the board and hopefully we can do that internationally as well um, but we'd love to do that for other reptiles we can use the same approach it's just thinking about the methods very carefully yeah, I would love to read that paper that did this on, on wild dragons. That's fascinating. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and then, Lloyd, I'm going to try and do the same thing with some questions that have come in that are on a similar vein. Um, so the restricted intervention technique, what's the basis for that? Have other zoos adopted it? And if so, what have they found? And in terms of welfare risks, what are its main drawbacks? Yeah, so um, its basis essentially is to let the chimps feed chimps um, and remove the human from their social world. Um, it's been an ongoing uh, uh, practice advocated by the EEP um, for an extensive period of time. We've seen reductions in 
stereotypies um, slight um, to some extent those stereotypies are difficult to to eliminate completely and I would say for us as keepers one of the most difficult challenges or drawbacks to to it is how a sort of undefined it is it is a loosely defined concept and so it's up to us as keepers to sort of interpret what is restrictive enough and what is too intensive um, and of course that depends very largely on the individuals that you have and reading their their social cues and behaviors um, and so for us we try and interpret it, what we have written in management guidelines and, and from advice from other keepers and interpret that to our own individual chimpanzees that we care for so that sort of negotiation between interpreting what's written down and then applying that to the chimpanzees that we care for i think is a difficulty uh, generally speaking i guess it helps with all the records and knowledge of your animals oh 100 uh, certainly when you have a 58 year old chimpanzee there's a lot of records there that's been written down some of them slightly more helpful than others. Obviously, our standards of record keeping has changed dramatically since the 1960s. Um, but it, is, it shows testimony, really, how important zoo records are for these long-lived animals so that we can see what they've been through and see their life histories, you know. Um, I am one of many, many keepers who have looked after Coco, for example. And so her life is, I am just a small part of that grand scheme of her life. Yeah, records are essential for those long-lived animals, for sure. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to all of the Speed Talk uh, speakers, presenters this afternoon. So we are now at the end of this session. So we have a break now until 14.20, uh, where we have the last session of the day. So I'd just like to extend my thanks to all of the speakers in the session that has just occurred. Please remember that if you do have further questions to pop them in the Slack and hopefully all presenters will have a chance to look at any further questions that come in. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your presentations and enjoy the break until 20 past two.